This is quite a turnout today. I want to welcome all of you to the Plato Society's first colloquium for 2015-2016. I am Alice Lewis. I'm the president of the Plato Society this year. There are many of you here today who are not Plato members, which is wonderful. I would like to let you know that if you are interested in more information about Plato, we have a sheet out on the table in the front where if you put your name and phone number or email address, we will get in touch with you. Uh, you can also go to the website, which is theplatosociety.org. The Plato Society is one word. Uh, and you'll find an application form there if you're interested in our program. And now we come to the main event. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Randall Schoenberg. He is simply a modern day hero, a man who found himself in a position to right one of history's most grievous wrongs, who did not turn away in the face of overwhelming opposition and persevered until he won the return of the Blockbauer Klimt paintings stolen by the Nazis to the rightful owner, Maria Altman. <laughs> Mr. Schoenberg is many things besides the inspiration for the movie, The Woman in Gold. Uh, he is also of counsel and a co-founding partner of the law firm of Burris, Schoenberg and Walden. He is a teacher at the USC School of Law on the topic of art and cultural property law. He's obviously an international expert on recovering looted art and a tireless philanthropist who will be honored on November 1st by the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust at their annual gala, receiving their Legacy and Leadership Award for 2015. Following his talk, Mr. Schoenberg has agreed to talk about his experiences, take questions about his experiences, the differences between the actual recovery and what was portrayed in the movie, and about the entire question which I know many of us are curious about, mm -hmm. and the entire question of both the legal and the moral issues that surround and impede efforts to recover looted art from both individual and countries. So everybody, let's put on our Plato hats. I know he's given this talk a lot of times. Let's see if we can come up with what we do best, some interesting and unusual questions <laughs> for him, maybe something he might have to think about for a second. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome Randy Schoenberg. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, is this working? Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Let me test this out. Okay. Uh, thank you, Terry, and thank you to the Plato Society for inviting me a second time to give this talk about the Klim paintings and the recovery of the Klim paintings. Um, it's, uh, I, I think, 90% of the audience may have heard it already, but for the 10%, uh, or so who, who haven't, uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. I hope you'll find, and, uh, and so I'm going to go through it again. For those of you who have heard me before, you can see if I, I change my, uh, my story at all. Uh, maybe after seeing the film so many times, some of the fictional parts may have slipped into the, into the reality. So you can all check me on that and ask me questions afterwards. Okay, so without further ado, here is the story of the recovery of the Klimt paintings. Um, we start, if I can get this to work, oh, there we go, with my client, uh, Maria Altman, who some of you probably in the audience knew. Uh, we're coming up on her 100th birthday in, in February, and uh, she was just a terrific, terrific woman, a very close friend of my family, and uh, miss her very much. And this is really her story and the story of these amazing paintings that she was able to recover. So let's go back now over a hundred years ago to the uh, beginning of the 20th century in Vienna, Austria. Austria was at that time the center of a large empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which wasn't just Austria and Hungary. It's about 12 or 13 different countries today that made up that enormous empire. It was really one of the world's great powers and a cultural center, an intellectual center, and a place, of course, uh, where the large Jewish population gravitated over the, uh, the previous decades. Jews were fully emancipated in Austria in 1867. That's just a, a few years after the US Civil War. They were given 
full civil rights. Until that time, they really were not allowed to come into Vienna to buy property, to work there. Uh, in 1948, I think they said there were less than 2,000 Jews in Vienna. By uh, a little after 1900, there were 200,000 Jews. So what happened when Jews were given civil rights is they flooded into the capital city from all the outlying areas, from Bohemian Moravia, from Hungary, also from Galicia, into the central capital of Vienna. And this coincided with the Industrial Revolution. And so it presented an opportunity for some families, not all, but some families, to make enormous fortunes. And many, many Jewish families became very wealthy during this time period. And the Blochs and the Bauers are two of these families. So uh, this is Gustav and Theresa Bloch Bauer. That's Maria's father, Gustav Bloch, who married uh, Theresa Bauer. The Blochs were uh, from a family that had a sugar company that had started out outside of Prague, where they were from, and became, uh, under the name Austrian Sugar Industry Corporation, the really the monopoly power uh, that they had in Austria, controlling most of the sugar production at that time. Remember, this is not Hawaii, so it's not sugar cane. They, they made it from sugar beets. So there'd be these beet farms, and they would produce sugar, and they really monopolized that and became very, very wealthy. The Bowers, uh, their, the, Teresa's father was a banker, but also involved in railroads, which were building up at that time, also became very, very wealthy. So this is Gustav and Teresa Bloch-Bauer, they, and they had younger siblings, Ferdinand and Adele. So there were two brothers named Bloch, who married two sisters named Bauer. Uh, when the Bauer's brother died, they decided all to combine the name and preserve it and made it Bloch Bauer, right? Bloch is sort of ordinary, Bauer's very ordinary, but Bloch Bauer sounds very sophisticated, so they became the Bloch Bauers. Uh, and here you see Ferdinand in, uh, in his hunting garb with one of his trophies, or soon to be trophies, and there is the famous Adele Bloch Bauer. Now, Adele was, was uh, quite a bit younger that her husband Ferdinand. She was uh, the younger sister of Maria's mother. And whereas Maria's parents were able to have five children, Maria herself was the baby of the family, uh, sort of a afterthought baby. I think her, the next older sibling was eight years older than Maria. And then she had three brothers uh, above that. So she was really an accident baby. Uh, her uncle and aunt, Ferdinand and Adela, were unsuccessful having children. Adela, I think, had several stillborn uh, children and, uh, and miscarriages uh, during her life, very sad. But perhaps to compensate for that, I think, she developed a real taste in culture and art and art collecting. And the two of them had a wonderful home. Here it is in Vienna. Uh, this is their home. If you've been to Vienna, you know, in the same time period we're talking about, 1860s to 1900, the, the Austrians cleared out the old city walls and built what's called the Ringstrasse, this big, large boulevard that circles the center of the town. This is one block out, uh, about a block away from where the opera is. So if you know where the Vienna Opera is, if you walk in the other direction from the center, one block out, this is where Elisabethstrasse is. And uh, so it's a very prominent location, a beautiful home that they lived in, and they filled it with artworks, uh, here are some of the artworks, probably more Ferdinand style. He was a little bit older and more conservative. conservative. These would be considered Austrian Biedermeier paintings, famous uh, at the time, 19th century artists like Ferdinand Waldmüller and Ammerling and Rudolf von Alt and people like that. They collected dozens of these. There's a Rodin sculpture they also had, uh, very nice. They had a Porcelain, porle, ugh, sorry, porcelain collection that was the largest in, of its kind in the world. Over 300 settings of antique porcelain. Each setting is a cup and saucer. You imagine having 300 of these. Where would you put them in your home? But they had, they had uh, uh, apparently enough enough space. And this is this is just five of them. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and then. Uh, they had, of course, a nice summer house, right? Everybody has to have a nice summer house. This one is outside of Prague. Um, I've actually been corresponding with a journalist who wants to write about it. This was never returned to the family. Uh, but this home is one really interesting aside to this otherwise still fascinating story. Uh, this home of Ferdinand and Adele was taken by the Nazis when they invaded Czechoslovakia in 1939. 
and made into the residence for what they called the Reichs Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, which was the Nazi governor of that area. First, a man named Konstantin von Neurath, and then he was uh, moved aside, and then it became the home of Reinhard Heydrich and his family. So those of you who know, Reinhard Heydrich is the architect of the final solution. He was sort of Hitler's golden boy, and he set up the Wannsee Conference, where they plotted the extermination of all the Jews in Europe. Uh, he was then assassinated several months later, leaving this castle, driving into Prague. He was assassinated by Czech partisans. The Nazis retaliated by liquidating all the men and boys in a town called Lidice, which was a very famous episode during the war. So famous that there are actually two films that were made in Hollywood about that. Uh, one of them my mother's father did the music for. Uh, and uh, anyway, so it's, it's uh, just a, one of the very, very many interesting asides in this uh, to think that Reinhard Heydrich, as he was plotting the Wannsee Conference, was living in, in this home. Okay, so back to the Klimts. Uh, here's Gustav Klimt. Now, Gustav Klimt, you see, he didn't live that long, actually, but he was really the most famous, the most expensive artist in Austria at the turn of the century. He had started out as just the most talented academic-style painter of his generation, got big commissions to do large murals and projects for the government, but then started putting in elements that the, uh, the officials didn't like, pointing his finger at a little too many uh, important people, and was sort of expelled or left the academy and formed what was called the Secession, which was a group of artists who were not going to be part of the mainstream official academy. Uh, he got tired of his friends in the Secession and then went out on his own and became just a very successful independent painter. And he developed a, a sort of more modern, impressionist, uh, if you want, style of painting. Uh, and his customers were, a lot of them, these sort of newly wealthy Jewish families like the Blochbauers. It wasn't just the Blochbauers, also the Lederer family, the Zuckerkandl family. I think just those three families alone purchased 30 of his approximately 100 large-scale paintings. So about a third of his output was bought just by these three Jewish families. And so they, they were his main customers. And it's probably due to Adele more than Ferdinand that the Blochbauers uh, started purchasing paintings by Klimt. And here we have some sketches of Adele. Adele was, according to her niece Maria, a very forward, progressive thinking woman, a very educated and smart woman. She, Maria always said if she had lived in a different time, if she had lived today, she would have been a lawyer or a politician or a writer, uh, someone really who took, took uh, an, a more active role. But in those days, as the younger wife of a sugar baron, really what she could, could only do is to have a salon where she would invite intellectuals of the time, artists, composers, writers, and invite them to her home and have parties and talk about the issues of the day. She was very uh, political also and friends with, with the uh, leading socialists of the time, people like Karl Renner, who became the president of, of Austria, uh, were her, her close friends. And so uh, she obviously wanted not just the old 19th century Biedermeyer artwork in her home, but something more modern. And so she began sitting for a portrait uh, with Klimt, and it took several years. These sketches, there are hundreds of them, where Klimt is trying out different, uh, different poses, uh, until he finally finished in 1907 with the famous gold portrait, the woman in gold, the lady in gold, however you want to call it, the portrait of Adele Blochbauer, number one. And you can see, there's a laser pointer here, wow, okay. Uh, you can see this sort of mosaic style with the gold, Apparently, he had visited Ravenna in Italy and seen the old mosaics there and was influenced by that and decided to cover Adela in this sort of golden mosaic here. Uh, Klimt was, was very famous for uh, having lots of models, lots of nudes, uh, and he painted, if you see this picture, in this long smock, right, with nothing on underneath, apparently. And, and uh, when he died in 1918, there were 18 illegitimate children who claimed <laughs> that he was the father. So there always have been rumors that, that he had a, a, an affair of some sort with Adele. Um, 
let's go back to the, to the picture. Uh, Maria said she asked her mother once, did Adela have an affair with Klimt? And her mother said, oh, of course not. It was an intellectual friendship. And then Maria added, well, she would have said that anyway, even if it wasn't an intellectual <laughs> friendship, so who knows. Uh, but uh, anyway, Adela sat for a second portrait with Klimt. Now, this one finished 2012, and whatever heat might have been with, with them uh, in the initial painting probably has disappeared. At, by this time, it's a much more reserved and staid look. Uh, you can see Klimt has now moved on from his gold style, which he really only did about four or five paintings with that, that gold mosaic. Now he's incorporating Japanese figures and doing something completely different. Adela is the only person, I think, who has two full-length portraits by Klimt. So she was really one of his, his great patrons. Uh, the, the family purchased several other paintings. This one is the famous beechwood or birch trees, depending on if you look at the thick trees or the thin ones. It's given a different title. Uh, artists often don't give their works titles. They're given by the, the gallerists who sells them. So sometimes the titles change. Uh, there's this beautiful apple tree, which may have been painted when Klimt was staying with the Blochbauers in their estate outside of Prague in their summer home. He may have painted this for them then. So, and this painting is slightly unfinished. If you can see the lower corner here, so it probably was purchased from Klimt's estate when Klimt died in 1918. He died during that famous flu epidemic at the end of World War I. Uh, the other younger artist, Egon Schiele, visited Klimt in the hospital, painted him on his deathbed, and then died several months later of the same flu epidemic. Uh, this is before penicillin, obviously. So very sad. He died. Um, the, sorry, there's one other painting this beautiful Schlosskammer am Adersee. It's one of a series of four paintings by Klimt. Um, really beautiful. Okay, so not only Klimt died, but Adele also uh, succumbed not to the flu, but to meningitis. She was 42 years old, I think, 42 or 43, in uh, 1925, in the beginning of the year in January. She developed meningitis, which is swelling in the head. Again, no penicillin. She died uh, within a matter of days. Uh, so very, very suddenly, and two years before that, she had written out a will by hand. It was shortly after her mother had died, and uh, perhaps with the influence of Maria's father, who was the lawyer of the family, Adela wrote out this will, and Maria's father is listed as sort of the executor uh, in, in various places. And so here's the will, and this really is the, the genesis of this whole case, of the whole story, because in this four-page will, these are two of the four pages, she has uh, actually in this whole section here a bunch of bequests. She's giving money. Again, she's very progressive. She's interested in the universities and in the workers' society and the schools and the uh, uh, orphan society and things like that. So she's giving a whole bunch of different bequests. And finally, in this last paragraph, she says, my two portraits and the four landscapes of Gustav Klimt Bitte ich meine Ehegatten, that means I ask please my husband after his death to give them, here's the verb of course at the end in German, um, give them to the Austrian State Gallery in Vienna. And then in the same sentence she's talking about her library in, uh, in outside of Prague, it's going to the uh, people and workers library. Okay, so after her husband's death she wants these pictures, the, her two portraits and the four landscapes of Klimt to go to the Austrian gallery. What is the Austrian gallery? I think I have a picture of it. There it is. Austrian gallery is one of the Habsburg palaces that, uh, af especially after World War I, uh, is turned into a gallery for modern Austrian art. And Adele, who's very friendly with the new socialist uh, rulers in, and government in Austria wants to support the arts in this fledgling country after World War I, and so she wants her paintings to go to this wonderful museum. Uh, and at the time, certainly her husband also probably wanted that. He be later became the president of the Friends of the Museum. And it's interesting, in the year following uh, her death, there's a, sort of a probate proceeding, and in that probate proceeding, Maria's father, the lawyer, Gustav uh, Blochbauer, writes that Adela makes certain requests in her will which do not have the binding character of a testament. 
Okay, so I'll explain that in a minute. And then he says, nevertheless, her husband dutifully promises to fulfill her wishes. It should be noted that the Klimt paintings were not her property, but his property. So this is in 1926, before there's any dispute, before the Nazis come in. Um, this is how the family uh, feels about this bequest. First of all, the bequest itself is not binding on Ferdinand. That's at least how Maria's father wrote about it. How is that possible? In wills and trusts, it's a very tricky area of the law. If you go to law school, you have to learn it and take an exam, a bar exam. And then if you don't practice in that field, you forget it immediately. <laughs> uh, but all you remember, and I'm one of these, all you remember is be careful, OK? Don't ever do anything with a will, because it's almost impossible to get it right, OK? And, and this is one of those areas. So you can make a request in a will which is not binding. It's called precatory language. Now let me give you an example. Let's say we have a dog. We don't. But let's say we had a dog. And I, I, I dropped dead. And in my will, it says, my dear wife, please take care of the dog after I'm gone. And she says, thank God he's dead. That dog is out of here tomorrow, OK? <laughs> That's OK. That's, whoops, that's precatory language, OK? Um, if, on the other hand, I said, as a condition of receiving a penny from my estate, you must agree to continue to take care of our dog in the manner to which he has become accustomed until its dying day, right? That's mandatory, right? That's clearly required. And there's no clear dividing line between those two examples. You can come up with lots of different examples. And, and, and so sometimes it's precatory, sometimes not. And of course, the person who died is no longer there to say what they really meant. And it's up to everybody else to figure out is it just a request? Is it not? Interestingly enough, the family saw this as just a request, not binding. Still, Ferdinand said he promised to fulfill it, for whatever that's worth. And then there's this mention that it's his paintings and not hers. So what does that mean? Well, we're talking about 1920s Austria, not 2000 in, in uh, California. It's not a community property situation. It's a very male-oriented uh, place. Adela had property. She owned half of their home in Vienna. But these paintings were considered his property. I, apparently, he bought them, and uh, he would be considered the owner. Matter of fact, the rule at that time in Austria was if there was any question, the man owned it. So <laughs> for what it's worth. OK, so that's how things were in 1926. Uh, I had this other painting. Uh, after Adela died, Ferdinand bought this, uh, also unfinished painting of their friend Amalia Zuckerkandl had hung in his bedroom. Uh, in 1936, he gave this painting, the Schlosskammer am Attersee, to the Austrian gallery. So of the six paintings mentioned in Daly's will, one he gave to the museum, leaving five. But he got another one. So we're back at six again, making it just confusing to tell the story. Um, in December 1937, Maria marries her love, Fritz Altman. Uh, Maria was 21 years old in 1937. She turned 22 uh, just after they got back from their honeymoon in Italy in, uh, in February. And uh, two weeks later, the Nazis invaded and annexed Austria in the famous Anschluss of March 1938. And of course, her life turned over upside down overnight, as did the lives of every Jew living in Austria. And uh, it was really, really uh, a shock to the system. The German Jews had sort of a series of, of years between 33 and 38 where the Nazis enacted one law after another. For the Austrian Jews, they went from being on top of the world to at the very bottom in one day. And so this is what happened to the Blochbauers and the Altmans. Ferdinand Blochbauer was an immediate target of the Nazis. He knew this. And so he fled. He fled immediately on the eve of the Anschluss into Czechoslovakia, first to his home. But then over the next year, as the Nazis took over Czechoslovakia, he fled then again to Zurich, Switzerland. And he managed to live and survive in Zurich, Switzerland until the end of the war. And he died just shortly after the war ended in November of 1945 never seeing his family again, never seeing any of his property again. Uh, what happened to his, his brother and, and, uh, and their children? Um, unlike in the movie, Maria's father actually died in the summer of 1938, shortly before she fled. 
uh, it was a terrible summer for Maria because her, her newlywed husband, Fritz, was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Dachau. This is also not in the movie. It would have been, I think, a whole separate movie. Uh, Fritz was sent to Dachau because his older brother, Bernard Altman, was a very wealthy, famous sweater manufacturer, also with a huge art collection. And, uh, and Bernard Altman fled, just like Fernand Blochbauer did. Uh, very smart guy, though. He, ha he had a textile company, so of course, he was owed money by customers all over the place. So he wired all of them and said, don't send any money to Vienna, I'll come and pick it up. And so he went from Prague to Budapest to Rome to Paris to London, picking up the receivables that were due his company, collected the money, and then went to the British and said, let me start up a new factory in Liverpool. Okay? And immediately started up a new business. He's one of these, you know, there's some people you could drop them on a deserted island on Friday, on Monday they'd be a millionaire. That's Bernard Altman. <laughs> So, so he did all this. The Nazis were very upset because they wanted to take over this textile company. They wanted all the money due the company. And so they arrested his younger brother, Fritz, and sent him to Dachau and really held him as ransom. I mean, until, until he was ransomed, held him as prisoner until Bernard ransomed him out uh, by paying back. I don't know how he came up with all the money, but in a matter of, of weeks, he was able to raise the money and sent it to the Nazis, signed documents. Maria actually had to fly with the Gestapo to Berlin. She said they were all perfect gentlemen uh, for some reason. But she was there also to sign papers. And then Fritz was released at the end of the summer uh, in 1938. They were still under house arrest. And very much like in the movie, this part is, is relatively accurate, uh, they had to invent a story about a dentist appointment. And they snuck out the back and got to a plane. Uh, which didn't take off right away, but then finally took them to Cologne in, in northern Germany. There they were supposed to meet someone to take them over the border in Holland, but that person didn't make it, and so they had to find someone else. They made it to the border and, and crossed under the border thanks to a, a, a Dutch priest who was then, a few months later, he was arrested for doing the same thing and executed. They managed to avoid the Dutch police because, remember, when you escaped from Germany into Holland, you were now an illegal alien. And the Dutch were actually returning people back to Germany who were fleeing. So they had to evade the Dutch and finally met up with Bernard Altman in Amsterdam and flew to safety in Liverpool. So that's how Maria and Fritz escape, escaped uh, the Nazis. They stayed in Liverpool for a short time and then went to Fall River, Massachusetts, where Bernard set up yet another factory for textiles, and, uh, but after a short while, they then moved to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, where Fritz wanted to work in the aerospace industry uh, during the war, uh, helping the war effort, and so they remained here in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, they reconnected with friends of theirs from Vienna, my maternal grandparents, Eric and Trudit Seisel, and both families had managed to flee. My grandparents fled the day after Kristallnacht on November 10th, 1938, from Vienna. Uh, same type of trajectory, first to, to uh, Cologne and then over the border into France, then to New York and then Los Angeles. Uh, my mother was born in 1940 here in the United States. Uh, Maria's first child was also born in the United States in 1940, and so they became, the children became friends, and my mother really grew up with the Altman kids. Uh, the, Maria had four children uh, as her, her sort of surrogate cousins or, or siblings because she was an only child. So the families were very, very close, and that's how I come into the picture 50 years later. Uh, but we'll get to that. OK. So, so what else happened to the rest of Maria's family? Her older brothers all managed to escape and ended up in Vancouver, Canada. Her older sister, Louisa, was married to a, a Yugoslavian Jewish um, uh, uh, lumber baron named Gutmann. And he, uh, so they were in Cro Croatia. And she went there trying to avoid the Nazis, thinking that that would be safe. But of course, the, the Nazi allies in Croatia uh, took over there. And uh, Jews were all really deported and, and sent to Auschwitz uh, relatively early from that area. They managed, uh, thanks to a friend of, of Maria's sister, they were, they were hidden and managed to survive during the war in Croatia in hiding until the end of the war. At the end of the war, they came out, and uh, Louisa's husband then was arrested by the communists for being a capitalist. And he was then tried and executed by the communists. So after being Jewish and surviving the Nazis, he was then killed uh, by the communists. 
Louisa and her two children then went to uh, manage to get out and go to Israel. They were there during, I think, during the War of Independence, and then uh, and then moved to Vancouver and joined Maria's three brothers. So the rest of the family was all in Vancouver, and Maria and Fritz stayed down here in in Los Angeles. Uh, what happened to the paintings? Let's go back to the paintings. I think. Sorry, it's going to get complicated, but hang on. So. Ferdinand Blochbauer, right? He fled, he goes to Czechoslovakia, he goes to, to Switzerland, and a lawyer is put in to liquidate his estate because the Nazis impose taxes on him. They accuse his company of, of tax evasion, and then instead of having the company pay the back taxes, they went after the directors like Ferdinand. And so they imposed a huge tax penalty on him and used that to take all of his property away. And there was a lawyer a big Nazi named Dr. Erich Führer, his name was really Führer, uh, who had been an early Nazi even during the illegal period in Austria, and he became the liquidator of Ferdinand's estate. And Dr. Führer uh, had a meeting, let's see, actually I'll go to that document next, sorry, right there, in 1939. Uh, in Ferdinand's home, this is a, a protocol of the meeting in the home there, and it talks about all the people who were there, all the representatives of the various museums are there, all the representatives of various uh, Nazi authorities, including a representative of Hitler himself. You know, Hitler had studied art in Vienna and unfortunately wasn't let into the academy and went on to politics. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Maria always joked, you know, if he had only been allowed to be a painter, right, the world would have been a better place. Uh, but uh, for, because of that, Hitler liked to think of himself as an art connoisseur, and really wherever the Nazis invaded, he went around and purchased uh, artworks from fleeing Jewish families and from various collections. And uh, also his, his uh, colleague Hermann Goering competed with him in that, and uh, Hitler had the right of first refusal. And so his representatives were there, and he actually took a, a couple of, of Ferdinand's paintings. I think I have one. Let's see, this one, the Graf Esterhazy, one of these old, older Biedermeyer paintings, much more Ferdinand and uh, Hitler style than the day list, I think. Um, so uh, all these officials are there, and they decide what to do with all the artworks. You can see them all listed here. This is everything. The Klimps are listed first. Um, and so here's what, what happened to them. Let's go back. Now I'm ready for it. So Dr. Führer went to the Austrian gallery and he said, okay, I'll, I'll trade you the gold portrait and the apple trees, and in exchange, give me back Schlosskammer am Attersee, okay? So he gave them two, got back one, and then flipped this one and sold it to a guy named Gustav Uschitzky. Everybody's named Gustav in the story, sorry. So, uh, who is Gustav Wyszynski? He's one of those 18 illegitimate children of Gustav Klimt. <laughs> he was a film director, a very famous and successful Nazi film director. His most successful film is called Heimkehr, or Returning Home, and it's about the invasion of Poland, so you can imagine. Uh, anyway, he took the success he had on these propaganda films and used it to buy paintings that had belonged or had been painted by his, his uh, father, his putative father. So this is one. This ended up with, with Gustav Wyszynski. Uh, let's go back. The other portrait of Adela was then sold to the Austrian gallery, so they ended up with the two portraits and the apple tree. The beechwood or birch trees was sold to the City Museum of Vienna, another, another museum. Um, and the houses in Unterach was kept by Dr. Führer along with 11 other paintings to compensate himself for a job well done, liquidating the estate. Why not? So uh, at, the end, at the end, you have three of the paintings in the Austrian gallery, the apple tree and the, and the two portraits, one painting in the city museum, uh, this one with Dr. Führer, and this one with Gustav Wyszynski, the one that Ferdinand had actually given away. Um, the, the one other painting, this Amalia Zirkokandl painting, has a completely different story, and it still hasn't been given back by the Austrians, uh, much to my dismay. Uh, it went into the hands of this woman's son-in-law. She was Jewish. Uh, she was actually killed, along with one of her daughters. Uh, she died in the war, and her, in Belzets, I think. Uh, but her son-in-law managed to sell it to an art, 
uh, dealer who kept it and then donated it to the museum. Uh, the Austrians have refused to give it back because they say they're not sure how Ferdinand, uh, how his estate lost, lost this. Maybe he gave it back to them. Maybe something else happened. I don't see how it makes a difference or is possible either way. But anyway, this is a, a totally different story. So back to uh, Dr. Fuhrer. He kept, all, kept selling everything. And at the end of the war, all of these different paintings are in different locations. Um, and uh, so the war ends, Oops, before we get to Hubertus, the war ends and uh, Ferdinand dies. So then what? When I started out on this case, I, I didn't really have a conception, I think, of, of war. It, actually, the, the uh, Iraq war hadn't started yet, because um, when I started, it was 1998. And it just didn't make sense to me, right? The war ended. Why didn't Ferdinand go back? and pick up all of his stuff. And uh, over time, I learned uh, the war devastated Austria. All of Europe was, was devastated. Civilians were not allowed to return to Austria for two years after the war, not until 1947. It wasn't until 1948 that Austria enacted, with the pressure of the US military, restitution laws that allowed Jews to recover their property. So the entire Nazi period in Austria was six years. But it took another three years before Jewish families were able to try to recover some of their property, real estate, businesses, artworks, et cetera. And so it wasn't until 1947, 1948, that the heirs of Ferdinand Blochbauer, he had named in his will his two nieces, Maria and Luisa, and one of Maria's brothers, Robert, as his heirs, that the three of them hired a lawyer, uh, again named Gustav, uh, <laughs> Gustav Rienisch, uh, to, to look into what could be recovered from Ferdinand's property. So it was 1947-48. And in 1947, Dr. Rienisch wrote to the Austrian gallery and said, I've heard that you have some Klimt paintings from Ferdinand Blochbauer. Is that true? Yes, we have these, these three. He um, says, well, what is your position with regard to my client's claims for restitution? And the Austrian gallery said, what claims for restitution? These paintings were given to us by the will of Adele Blochbauer in 19, uh, when she died in 1925. And her husband was allowed to keep them during his lifetime. But we own the paintings. We only have three of them. You have to find the other three and give them to us. Otherwise, we're going to sue you. That was what they wrote. Uh, little chutzpah, right? Because they had themselves given back the, the Schlosskammer Matersee to, to the Nazi lawyer. But they took a very aggressive position. Meanwhile, uh, Gustav Rienisch, the lawyer, was able to track down a lot of other property. So for any of you who saw the Monuments Men, right, with George Clooney. So George Clooney and his friends <laughs> discover all these paintings that Hitler and Goering and the Nazis had taken uh, in these mines in Salzburg, near Salzburg. And what they did was they took those paintings, George Clooney, he took them to Munich and set up the art collecting point. And the art collecting point did not deal with individuals. It only dealt with foreign countries. And it was designed by the US military to give artworks back to the countries of origin. So if they could tell that something was taken from France, they sent it back to France and said, France, you deal with it, Holland, Austria, etc. So when these paintings were discovered there and people identified the paintings, then they would, uh, they would write to the authorities in Austria. The authorities in Austria would have to request the paintings be given back to Austria. Then they would have to apply to get them back in Austria. And then if they wanted to take them out of the country, let's say to Vancouver and Los Angeles, they had to apply for an export permit. And what the Austrians decided was, this is great, this procedure, right? Because whatever anybody recovers, all the Jews had been either killed or gone, right? So there was almost no one left in Vienna. So all these families who were trying to recover things, they had to apply for export permits. And so the Austrians then used this procedure to extort donations to their federal museums. Because what they would say is, let's say you applied to take 10 paintings out, they'd say, no, these 10 paintings are too important to Austria for us to let them out of the country. And if you appealed the decision, they would say, well, if you were to donate five of them, you can have the other five and take them out of the country. And through this procedure, they enriched the Austrian Federal Museums after the war at the expense of 
lots of Jewish families, not just the Blochbauers. The Rothschild family uh, donated several hundred artwork, donated several hundred artworks to Austrian museums in order to get other things out of Austria after World War II. So this is not the Nazis, this is the post-war Austrian government. So uh, that's what happened with Dr. Fuhrer. He, uh, uh, sorry, with Dr. Renish. He decided to meet with the Austrian officials and he said, listen, we're not gonna fight over the Klimt paintings with this will of a de la Blochbauer, even though he looked at the will and said, well, it may not be binding. He said, we're not gonna fight over it. We know this because he wrote a letter to Maria's brother, so we have a very detailed record of this. So we're not gonna fight over the Klimt paintings, but we hope that you'll let us take out all of these old Austrian Biedermeyer paintings, right? The ones that Hitler had taken, the ones that Dr. Fuhrer had taken, those. And that worked. Over the next several years, 1948, 49, 50, the Blochbauers received a lot of paintings, a lot of these other artworks. Uh, they still had to donate some Klimt drawings, they had to donate some porcelain, but a lot of things they were able to recover and bring out of the country to their homes in North America. But the Klimt paintings remained in Austria as a result of this process until 50 years later, 1998, there was an exhibit in New York of uh, two paintings by Egon Schiele that were alleged to have been stolen and the district attorney in New York, Morgenthau, decided to seize them and declare them stolen property. And that caused a huge uproar in Austria and the minister said, we don't have any looted artworks, it's ridiculous, we can't be accused of this, everything was given back after the war. And this journalist, Hubertus Chernin, a wonderful guy, decided to investigate this. By the way, he's the one that uncovered uh, the Kurt Waldheim story. Uh, he's the one that first reported on priest sex abuse in Austria, so he was really a crusading journalist. And he decided to look and see, well, how did these artworks get into Austrian museums? And he uncovered this whole record of extortion after the war, that these Jewish families had been forced to give up their paintings and leave them in Austria in order to get other things out. And Austria, to its credit, in 1998 passed a new law. And the new law said that if we have artworks in our museums that were taken during the war and never recovered, we're going to give them back. If we have artworks that were recovered but then left here, donated to the museums in exchange for export permits, we're going to reverse that and give them back. And this was in September 1998. And that's when I got a call from Maria Altman. And Maria had been still in very close contact with my mother after my grandmother had died. And, uh, and she knew I was a lawyer and she got a call from Austria about this law. And she said, I need a lawyer, right? Her sister had, had just died a few months earlier and so she called me up. I was working downtown at a firm called Fried Frank, Harris, Shriver and Jacobson. Uh, Shriver is like Sergeant Shriver. A big New York firm with a small office. And, and uh, she called me up out of the blue. It was, September 1998, uh, right, right before my birthday. I was 31 years old still. And she said, Randy, I need some help. There's this new law. I knew Maria very well. I knew what the paintings were because I'd been to Austria and my mom had pointed out, see that picture of Adele Blochbauer? That's Maria Altman's aunt. So I knew the paintings, but I had no idea of her story, of the story of the paintings. I didn't know even that, that her family had owned the paintings. And so she told me this, this amazing story of what had happened to her and Fritz and what she had collected, all the documents after her sister had died. Uh, and it, it told a pretty compelling story, I thought, of uh, the loss of the, the pictures during the war, their sort of attempted recovery, and then the lawyer giving up in exchange for export permits. And I really thought that under this new law that she would be able to get them back. So I, I persuaded my, my firm to let me work on this case uh, and you know they, they sort of humored me and said okay you know give it a try and it really wasn't a lawsuit it was just dealing with the Austrian government they had set up a commission under this new law and I and we had to deal with the commission uh, and the commission actually didn't want to deal with anybody they wanted to decide on their own uh, what, what was going to happen and so but I sent them documents and, and opinions and unfortunately in 1999 about a year into this they made a decision they said We'll give back some porcelain, we're gonna give back some drawings, but the Klimt paintings are going to stay. Why? Because of the will of Adele Blochbauer, right? They said this is a gift that she made to us in her will, and we're not going to reverse that. And so then we had a decision what to do. 
Uh, at first, I said to Marie, I said, well, maybe you should try to file a lawsuit in Austria. And I found a lawyer for her. And the lawyer said, uh, well, you understand, in, in Austria, first of all, this new law doesn't give you a right to sue. So we have to sort of work around that. But even if we can figure out how to sue over this, uh, in Austria, you have to file with the court uh, court costs that are a percentage of the value at stake in the litigation. So at this point, everybody knew the paintings were very valuable. We thought it would be uh, as much as $2 million. Uh, it probably would have been three times that if, if you take what the value turned out to be. But $2 million she would have had to, to deposit with the court just to file the case. And Maria was a wonderful lady. She lived in Cheviot Hills. She still sold dresses uh, to other old ladies out of her home. <laughs> and uh, my mom said she was, she, Maria was so elegant and refined. And no matter who walked in, she'd make them feel like a queen. Right? She said, oh, you look so marvelous in this. And they just couldn't resist. They would buy whatever she, <laughs> whatever she was selling. Uh, so, so, but she didn't have $2 million. And we actually applied. You can apply to reduce the court costs. And we applied to the court. And the court said, well, you don't have to pay more than everything you own. You just have to pay everything you own. So they, all, all of her assets, other than her house, they would let her keep that. But ev all of her life savings, at that time she was you know, deep in her 80s, uh, it just was not going to be possible. So, so what next? And I just kept thinking, there's got to be some way to keep this case alive. There's something we could do. And, and I looked in the, the law books that every litigator has, uh, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the US Code. And there's a provision about when you can sue a foreign country, because Austria was the owner of these paintings. Austria had taken them. This was a federal museum in Austria. So we had to sue Austria. And, and there's something called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976. It's a law passed in the United States in 1976 that regulates when you can sue a foreign country. And you can tell by the title that the general rule is you can't sue. A foreign state is immune from prosecution in a US court. And there are some exceptions. And one of the very little used at that time exceptions was you can sue a foreign state in a case concerning property taken in violation of international law where the property is owned or operated by an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state that is engaged in a commercial activity in the United States. So what does that mean? No one really actually knows how that provision got into the law and what they were really thinking about. My suspicion is it was directed a little bit towards Cuba, because this law was worked on in the 60s and passed in 1976. But what, if you parse it out, what it means is in a case concerning property like this, taken by the Nazis in violation of international law, where the property is owned by this museum, a federal agency, an instrumentality or agency of a foreign state, and that museum does some commercial activity in the United States, then you can sue. So all I had to do was find something they did in the United States. And I found a book that they had published here. They accepted US credit cards. They advertised for the museum. There was some hook. And so I talked to my firm. I said, I think we can sue. And the firm didn't want to have anything to do with it, right? Because their business was not tilting at windmills and suing foreign countries. They, they did uh, you know, other things. And so I ultimately decided to go out on my own. And unlike in the movie, I, I did talk it over with my wife first. Uh, <laughs> we were expecting our second child. And, uh, and so I, I left, and I went out on my own. And I opened up uh, an office. In a, in a, I rented a tiny office from a friend of mine at Wilshire and Bundy uh, and, uh, and bought my own computer and just set up my own office. And one of the first things I did was I filed a complaint for Maria Altman against Austria. And I also told her before doing that also. That was also not right in the movie. Uh, but we filed this lawsuit. And I, I even have an email I sent her at the time saying, you know, it's sort of like a PR stunt. I, I just, we don't know where it's going to end up, but at least we keep the case alive. My thinking was, it's a political issue. We're dealing with the government. As long as we can keep the case alive in the public eye, anything can happen. So of course, Austria hired lawyers to defend. Uh, they hired Proskauer Rose, which is a very famous Jewish law firm. Uh, when I told Maria that, she says, what do you mean, Jewish law firm? I said, well, if you look at the list of lawyers, they have 30 lawyers with variants on the name Levy in the firm. Okay? So, 
we're in the skirball, I can say that, right? So, um, but they hired a guy who, who they thought was Jewish but wasn't, Scott Cooper, and he defended like any lawyer would by raising every possible argument in a motion to dismiss. We had a wonderful judge, she unfortunately passed away, Florence Marie Cooper, um, and uh, uh, she, much to everybody's surprise, denied the motion to dismiss and ruled in our favor. And on this issue of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, they had argued that even if we complied with each of these provisions, it was impermissibly retroactive to apply a law that was passed in 1976 in a case concerning events that took place in the 30s and 40s, right? It's sort of an ex post facto law. Uh, you cannot generally apply, for example, criminal laws after the fact. Uh, and, but she said no, that we could. And this issue then went up on appeal. Ordinarily, you can't appeal from a motion like that, but in sovereign immunity cases, you can. And so they went to the Ninth Circuit. And I argued for the first time in Pasadena in front of three judges in the Ninth Circuit. And again, miraculously, against everybody's expectation, we won. All three judges said we could go forward with the lawsuit, that it was not impermissibly retroactive to apply this this, uh, this law to this case. So at that point, we were feeling very good. It was now 2002, about four years into, the, into this whole ordeal. Uh, but then uh, the US government decided, the Bush administration decided that uh, they wanted to get involved. I guess the State Department was getting calls from every country in the world saying, what's going on in California? Are we gonna be sued for everything that ever happened in our countries? And, and so they filed a brief asking the Ninth Circuit to reverse itself. Uh, fortunately, the Ninth Circuit did not do that. The decision stood. But then Austria petitioned the US Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court issued a writ of certiorari in September, October of 2003. One of the very few cases that went up to the Supreme Court each year, only about 75 or 80 cases uh, since the Rehnquist era go up to the Supreme Court. So this is one of the very few civil cases that went up. But when you're facing a foreign country and the US government is on the side of the foreign country, uh, I guess the Supreme Court notices the case. And, and so we went up to the Supreme Court. And again, no one thought I could win. I'm sure the people here in the audience who were following it uh, thought it was a lost cause. And I was not overconfident myself, I have to say. But I, I really wanted just not to fall flat on my face, right? To maybe get one justice on our side to tell, so it wouldn't look like a ridiculous case. And I had done three moot court practice sessions, one at USC, my alma mater, one at Santa Clara, and one at Georgetown where people, judges and lawyers pretend to be the justices of the Supreme Court and ask you questions so you can get prepared. And I had done a lot of this and I thought, okay, I'm ready, I can go through this. And, and we finally got to the day in February in the Supreme Court, and I was the last one to get up and speak because we had won in the Ninth Circuit. So first it was Austria's lawyer uh, who spoke for about 20 minutes, and then, and then the US government lawyer spoke, uh, Deputy Solicitor General, and then it was my turn. And by the time I got up, it seemed as if the justices were at least entertaining some of them, our position. So it seemed like things were going okay. And I, I started out, you know, you don't have a, you don't give a speech in the Supreme Court because they, they talk to each other through questions to you, so you get interrupted. And so I had just a, a vague outline, and I said there are four grounds for affirming the Ninth Circuit decision. Ground one is, and I finished one sentence and was interrupted by Justice Souter. Uh, not in the film, it's Rehnquist, but it's Justice Souter, and he had this, heavy New England accent, and he's a very smart guy, and he, he started asking me this question. And to me, it sounded like da 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 like that. I, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and uh, this, you couldn't make up, it's, it's actually taped, uh, not video, but audio, you could actually listen to it. And so you can hear, he asked this long, convoluted question. And I, I didn't know what to say. And so I, you can hear me on the tape. I say, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I didn't understand the question. Could you please rephrase it? And there were these gasps in the audience. <laughs> and, but all the other justices smiled as if to say, oh, don't worry. He does that all the time. Right? <laughs> we, we didn't understand it either. And, and, and it, was, it was such a great ice. It turned out to be the best icebreaker because 
what, I wasn't going to BS them. I wasn't going to make things up and pretend that I was the world's expert on sovereign immunity and retroactivity and all these arcane concepts. Who was I? I was just a kid from LA representing my grandmother's friend, <laughs> trying to sue a foreign country to get back paintings that had never left Vienna, right? Crazy situation. So the rest of the argument went like a dream. It was 30 minutes. I answered questions. It was amazing. And it finished, and I sort of floated out of the courtroom down the steps. And my dad, who was a retired judge, I think for the first time, he said, you might have a chance of winning, right? I mean, it was, it was really, it felt so good. And, and we all celebrated. And I came back home, and I opened up the Daily Journal, which is our legal newspaper here for Southern California. And the headline was, Court Likely to Reverse Altman Case. <laughs> And it was a full page about how we were going to lose. So I, I called up the journalist. I said, you know, at least you could have said, Randy does a good job, but court likely to reverse. I mean, everybody here in Los Angeles was expecting me to lose. And here was, oh, Randy's going to lose. So, so I, you know, he said, oh, I've been reporting for 34 years in the Supreme Court. Trust me, I can tell by the body language, you don't stand a chance. I said, OK. That's what everybody's been saying anyway. Do me a favor, when the decision comes out, they don't tell the lawyers ahead of time. So you know, the journalists are the only ones who are there every day, and they, they find out. I said, when you find out, can you call me? Here's my phone number at home. So sure enough, three months later in June, I'm making breakfast for the kids, right? It's three hours later in DC, and I get this phone call from this journalist, Dave Pike. And he says, hello, this is Dave Pike. I said, OK, give me the bad news. He said, not bad news. You won, 6-3, and I started talking all this. I couldn't believe it, right? I practically dropped the phone, and, and wow, we won. And so I tried to call Maria, and her phone was already off the hook because people were calling her. And so I got dressed, and I raced over to Maria's, and we hugged, and her kids came over. We were celebrating, and then we realized, what are we celebrating? What did we just win? <laughs> nothing, nothing. We, had, we won the right to begin the lawsuit, begin the lawsuit. <laughs> this is now 2004, 2004, six years after she had called me. So we then entered what I lovingly call discovery hell, which is when the lawyers just torture each other back and forth, uh, which went on for a year or so. And we finally had a court-ordered mediation. And up to this point, this is now 2005, seven years, Austria had refused to sit down and talk with us about resolving the case. There was never any, any willingness to do that. And so I told Maria, I said, this mediation is going to be just a formality. We just have to appear. They're saying they're not going to do anything, and then we'll go home. Well, they brought a mediator from Austria. And very quickly, he said, uh, I sense from both sides that you want this over with. So we said, of course, yes, right? Maria was 89 years old. Um, and, and I guess Austria wanted it over with, although they must have had a different idea of what over with meant than us. Uh, and, but he said, you know, I have an idea. And this is actually something that, that he had taken from me because it's something I had suggested seven years earlier. And he said, why don't we have a, an arbitration in Austria? Why don't we pick arbitrators? Each side picks one. Those two pick a third. And we have this decided by an arbitration in Austria. And I said, ooh, that sounds great. Let me talk to Maria, right? And so we went aside. And, and I said, isn't this great? We could have this arbitration. And she said, are you crazy? Why would I want my case decided in Austria? We, the, the district court judge Cooper loves us. The Ninth Circuit loves us. The Supreme Court loves us, at least two thirds of them. Why would I ever want Austrians to decide the case? And I said, Maria, you're 89 years old. The Austrians can drag this out indefinitely. Even if we were to win, right? It could go back up to the Supreme Court. It'll be years. Even if we won in the United States, they don't have to enforce a US judgment. There's actually no treaty of enforcement between Austria and the United States, incredibly. Uh, Austria is a neutral country. And uh, so, so they could just ignore a judgment. I said, this way, if we win, we really win. And I think we need to take this chance. And fortunately, she stuck with me, as she did through the whole case. Did not have that big argument like in the movie. Uh, she, she agreed to it, and she allowed me to go, and we did an arbitration in Austria. And it wasn't a big public thing, like in the movie. It was actually a very small event, um, because there's no living witness to the will of Adele Blochbauer from 1925, and that was really the heart of the case. Uh, we submitted the arbitration, and it took them four months, uh, not the 30 seconds, like in the film. 
uh, and they finally issued their decision. I was returning home from a, a Sunday night poker game where I had lost $100 and felt a little bit bad. And sure enough, I got, got this little message on my Blackberry, so I raced over the computer you know, to open it up and had to read a few pages before I got to the verb, and we won. This time we really won. All three judges, all three arbitrators, had agreed with the position that we had taken from the very beginning, which was that Adela's will was precatory, it was not binding. It's what Maria's father had said in 1926. And therefore, these paintings should have been recovered by the family after the war, but they were given up in exchange for export permits for other pictures, and therefore under the new law had to be returned, and they, they agreed. And then we celebrated, because then <laughs> we really did win. So uh, it was really, you know, here's me at the Supreme Court with Maria, it's a good one. Uh, then we had what was my favorite part of the whole thing, which was an exhibit in, uh, at LACMA, at the LA County Museum of Art, and many of you probably saw it, and here was Maria. And it was the first chance since 1938 for Maria and all of her family, all of the kids and nieces and nephews and grandchildren to be in one room again with these famous paintings that had been in one room in Maria's uncle's home. Uh, and it was really, really an amazing thing, my, my favorite part. Uh, the gold portrait was then sold by the family to Ronald Lauder for the Neue Gallery in New York. It's on 86th and 5th on permanent display there. Um, you see these two, whoops, going back. Do you see these two statues? Uh, these were returned to the family in 2007 because uh, they were discovered in the Austrian gallery. Two statues by Georg Minna. And remember that inventory from 1939? It says two statues by Minna, but there was no picture of them. So they found these, and then they found this picture from 1907 in Mannheim, and they put two and two together and realized that these statues, which miraculously went into the museum in 1942, uh, must have also been taken from Ferdinand Blochbauer's home. So they gave them back to the family, and at my suggestion, the family donated them to the, Austrian Gal to the Neue Gallery, so they are reunited with the gold portrait there in Ronald Lauder's museum in New York. And that's the story of the Klimt paintings. Thank you very much. I go too long. Is it okay? I don't know what I want to do. 15, 15 minutes. Is it on? Yes. Randall. Yes. Napoleonic Code, common law difference in uh, attitude towards stolen art. Did that have anything to do with it? So, yeah, if I can repeat the question, is there, there's a difference between how, uh, you said Napoleonic Code, how the, the continental countries and the, the Anglo-Saxon countries deal with uh, stolen artworks. And it's, it comes down, my grandmother had studied law in Vienna and then she became a Latin teacher at Pali High uh, here because you'll have to learn so much Latin to learn uh, law in Austria. It's all based on this sort of old uh, conception of Roman law. Um, and so if you have uh, a, a term like bona fide purchaser, right, which is Latin, that, that's got to be important. Uh, a good faith purchaser usually gets to keep uh, an artwork or, or other property under, under European law. Um, in in uh, the United States, it's actually the opposite. We use a different Latin phrase, which is caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, right? So it's always this competition of who can have more Latin. Uh, caveat emptor means that if the buyer buys something that's stolen, they don't get good title, and a thief cannot convey good title in, in the United States. So uh, there, is, there is this difference in, in law. It wasn't an issue in our case, because our case had to do really with the will of a daily Blochbauer in this new law in Austria. But it is a big case, a big issue in many cases uh, that arise in the United States. I think I have a picture of the Picasso painting. Uh, this painting was, was purchased in New York by Marilyn Alsdorf and her husband. They have a wing of East Asian art at the Art Institute of Chicago. But she had it in her home on Lakeshore Drive and, and uh, had no idea that it was stolen uh, from France. Actually, it was owned by a German family and it had been stolen uh, they had deposited it with uh, Justin Tannhauser in France and was stolen there. Um, she paid, she in the 1970s paid, I think it was $370,000 for it, so quite a lot of money for it, having no idea that it was a stolen painting. Uh, 
ultimately she tried to sell it and then it was discovered and the, the grandson of the original owners was here in California and we had a, a lengthy lawsuit. It ultimately settled and that's one of the issues. That's why some of these cases settle. Because what law do you use? Do you use the European law, which, which it had passed through several hands in Europe and become a good faith purchase, right? So some dealer then sold it to someone in New York who then sold it to her. Uh, or do you apply the American law that says a thief can't convey good title and it's very, very difficult. This, this painting was, she bought it a second time for, for uh, over $7 million for my clients. So, so it was, uh, it was what, at that time what, probably the, the, the best recovery of a, of a U.S. case. Next question. Randy, th thank you. I've heard this three times and seen the movie and it just gets better. So. <laughs> it ch I change thank it every time, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I'm curious, you commented about the inaccuracies of the movies, and I know in an uh, interview with the Princeton Alumni Magazine, you said to the producer, I didn't say these, and he said, but in the movie you will. So <laughs> what should be the rights of somebody like yourself to have, a truth, have the story told truthfully? I mean, well, this is a story that doesn't really need embellishment. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I've been lucky all the way through this. There are many, many cases where I was not lucky and lost. Uh, this one, it just seems like whatever I did was the right thing. And so when it came to the movie, uh, there were actually a lot of documentaries done on the case, especially as we went to the Supreme Court and afterwards, uh, th four or five documentaries. And everybody was talking about doing a movie, but no one really did anything more than talk. And finally, in 2009, uh, BBC Films came because uh, Simon Curtis, I think his in-laws may be in the audience somewhere, uh, uh, his wife, uh, is Elizabeth McGovern, are the McGoverns here? Are they here? I don't know, in the, in the back there. Oh, they just left, okay. Um, Simon Curtis saw the, one of the documentaries and contacted a producer of BBC Films and they contacted me and Maria and said, we'd like to buy your life rights or an option on your life rights. And what did that mean? That means they buy the right to make a movie about your life and, and you negotiate whatever you want in that and I, I didn't want to put a lot of strings on it. I, I didn't want them to, to have me do anything illegal in the, in the film. Um, and uh, I was worried that because Klimt was such a, 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 uh, a uh, sex maniac that they could turn it into some sort of X-rated romp. I was a little concerned about that. Uh, there was, I don't know if anybody ever saw, there was a Ken Russell film called Listomania. And that, that kept going in my head that they could have Klimtomania and it would be, anyway, it was like a Barbarella type movie. Um, so other than that, I put no restrictions on it. And I think it was a brilliant thing to do in retrospect. I had no idea at the time that it was good, but now I've learned, you know, the last thing that a filmmaker wants is someone looking over their shoulder saying, you can do this, you can't do that, you need to do this, you can't do that. And I really, I think it was really the right move to give them carte blanche to do what they felt they wanted to do because otherwise the film would not have gotten made. It would have, it would have stayed at that level of a story that could be made but, but not because you really need a, a filmmaker and also the producers who put up all the money to, to have the freedom to make the film that they want. And so part of the film is my story and part of it is the film that they had in their head. Uh, that they wanted to incorporate things from their own families or things from their own story. And uh, that's fine, that's how movies get made. And I'm, I'm very happy that it was made because for Maria and me, we never really thought we could win, but telling the story was such a huge part of this. And now to have a feature film where millions of people are seeing it, and everybody flies an airplane now, is seeing it on the airplane. and. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing. So anyway, that, I hope that answers the question. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I, it's a wonderful story, and we could hear it many times. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in what's happened since. I mean, this had a happy ending. There are so many, um, so many pieces of property, so many wonderful pieces of art that haven't been restored. And I'm curious because you seem to have had dealings with the Austrian government and I'm curious as to your take on which government has been the most cooperative, Austria, Germany, um, even France, uh, some of the other European countries. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in your experiences in trying to recover 
other pieces of uh, art for people, if yeah. I assume that's what you're doing to some extent. Yeah, so, so uh, thanks for that question. It's, it, it's hard to say who's the best. The worst are all the Eastern European countries, so they've done nothing. It's almost impossible to get things back from Hungary, Czechoslovakia. They have some rules in some of the countries where they give them back to you, but you can't take them out of the country. Um, things like that. So Eastern Europe is a disaster, and it's, it's not just artworks, I mean all types of restitution. In Western Europe, sometimes they do the right thing, sometimes they do the wrong thing, and that's true in just about every country. Um, and it's true in the United States. There, let me see if I have a picture of the, of the Cranach paintings. If you want to see the most stolen paintings in America, go to the Norton Simon Museum, and you'll see these, these uh, pictures that were taken by Hermann Goering, from a Jewish art collector named Jacques Houtsticker. Now what happened to these is uh, George Clooney and his friends found them in the <laughs> salt mines uh, along with 200 other works from this, this Jewish dealer. He, by the way, he, he died, he fell on, uh, some had shipboard accident uh, fleeing from Europe and, and died. So his, his widow, it's very common in most of these cases where you have lingering issues is the original male owner didn't survive long enough to do restitution. It's the widow and kids who got sort of pushed around after the war. And so with the Hout stickers, it's exactly that. Um, his, his wife and, and son were pushed around. Uh, they didn't recover these 200 works. Uh, two weeks after the decision on the Klimts in Austria, the Dutch decided to give back the Hout sticker collection. Um, but not these two, because these two they had sold in the 1960s to a Count Stroganoff, like Beef Stroganoff, <laughs> who, who had erroneously claimed that they had been taken by the communists from his family, because they were sold in the same catalog as his family collection, but there's a note in the catalog saying these were not part of it, so I don't know how that happened. Uh, but anyway, he bought them from, he bought them from the Dutch, because uh, they settled that, and then he sold them to to uh, Norton Simon, who then put it with his collection in the, in the museum uh, that became the Norton Simon Museum. So these paintings are in Pasadena, and they're totally stolen art. There's no, I mean, I just told you the facts. There's, n there's no excuse for it, but the Norton Simon Foundation refuses to give them back. They've been fighting. The case has gone up to the Ninth Circuit twice already. Uh, the district judge has tried to dismiss it twice and been reversed. And now it's third time. Hopefully he'll get it right, and uh, and the paintings will, will go back. But they're still fighting, and it always on procedural grounds. Uh, the statute of limitations was unconstitutional. The act of state doctrine is being violated. The it interferes with foreign affairs to question what George Clooney did. That type of thing. I mean, seriously, that was their argument uh, in the last appeal. So. You can't just point your finger at European countries when we have people here in our own backyard who are behaving just as badly. So. Uh, my question again is about the movie. Do you have any idea what the reaction in Austria is to the movie? The reaction in, in Europe was actually very good. There was uh, an early review, in, an Austrian press review that said it should be used in schools. Uh, so, which I thought was really favorable. Uh, I, you know, I think it's, it's done relatively well in Europe, in, in the European countries where it's been shown, at least from what I've heard. Uh, so, I think the reaction is relatively good. I don't know how the, the characters who are portrayed in it, uh, whether they like their portrayal or not. Uh, one of the Amer American critics said, oh, it's so uh, terrible, all the Nazis are made into bad guys, right? <laughs> So, uh, it's it's very it's it's very true to how I perceived the Austrian officials is all is all I can say. Uh, the actually the actor who plays the Austrian lawyer, who's my opponent, um, is a guy named Justus von Dochnani. His father is the conductor Christoph von Dochnani, who does a lot of my grandfather's music. But that's not the interesting thing. It's that Christoph von Dachnani's mother was a Bonhoeffer. She's the sister of the one who plotted the assassination of Hitler and was executed after the war. So he has this really interesting family background. He plays the bad guy in the movie. So <laughs> he really knows what he's, what he's doing. And I think he did a great job with it. So. 
Do you happen to know what happened to those beautiful homes that they owned? So yeah, the, the homes, the, the one outside of Prague has never been returned. Um, Václav Havel, who everybody thinks is a saint, uh, privatized that home, he, his government. Uh, so after the fall of communism, it was still owned by the government. And they um, took all these problematic properties and privatized them. They gave them out to uh, private companies and then passed a restitution law afterwards so that it couldn't be recovered. Um, again, Eastern Europe is not the greatest for these type of things. So they never recovered anything from Prague. Uh, the Austrian home was also the subject of an arbitration that we had in Vienna, and it was returned, actually, in, in 2007. Um, it uh, very complicated, but the sugar company that Ferdinand owned, uh, all the stockholders, not just the Blochbauers, were trying to get back the, the stock of the company, and it was in the Russian zone after World War II, so it was delayed until the mid-'50s. And they were pressured then by the government to the, the Ferdinand Blochbauer heirs had to give up the, his Vienna home so that all the shareholders could settle their suit over the sugar company. They sort of extorted that. And so they basically were, were pressured uh, into giving it up for nothing. And in 2006 or seven, there was another arbit arbitration in Austria where they decided that was an extreme injustice. That's the term they use, because injustice, I guess, isn't enough. And they, uh, they gave back that home. Uh, to the family. In LACMA, there were five Klimt paintings. I'm not seeing where it's coming from. What happened to the remaining four? Uh, I didn't see who asked the question, but that, uh, I heard it. So what, what happened oh, over there? What oh. happened to the remaining four? What I happened to the remaining yeah. four pa Klimt so, paintings? So the, the, uh, the answer is I di didn't really know for a long time. They kept it confidential. Um, the big uh, uh, well, so the remaining four were auctioned off. I don't know if you knew that. So there was a big auction in December. Maria was not the only heir. Her sister and brother's families also shared in it. So collectively, they decided that none of them really wanted a $100 million painting in their home. Uh, and so, so they, they sold them. And they sold them at auction. It was the most successful auction of all time at that time. Uh, really beyond everybody's expectations. And uh, Christie's, who auctioned it off, wouldn't tell us who bought it. But the, the, the joke we had while it was going on was they, they might come to us and ask us for certain concessions. The buyers do that uh, at Christie's. And you wouldn't know whether it was going to someone in Beverly Hills or someone in Kazakhstan, right? And, and so Christie said it, it didn't go to Kazakhstan. So that's, that's all I know. Um, it turned out that the, uh, the second portrait of Adela, I think, was purchased by Oprah. Uh, and she has loaned it to the Museum of Modern Art, although that's not completely public, I think. But that's the rumor I heard. So whoever bought it, I think it may be her. Uh, someone with too much money, of course, but it's because it was like $90 million. But she has loaned it to uh, MoMA, so it's also in New York. The birch trees, I think, were bought by Paul Allen. That came out last year. And, uh, and he has some museum he's setting up in Seattle, I think, where it's going to be. And then I don't know where the apple tree and the houses in Unterach are. But that's, that's, that's what I know right now. But they'll turn up. You know, These paintings like this, they don't disappear for very long. <laughs> Excuse me, let's go with the mics. This person was. Did Austria, did Austria, Austria reimburse you and the others for all the costs? No, that wasn't part of the the arbitration uh, agreement that we made. So no, they just re they returned the paintings, which was which was enough, I guess. But but uh, yeah, no, they could have paid rent for the paintings, having them for sixty years, but they didn't do that either. But but uh, we were happy just to get the paintings back. The LA Times reported yesterday about a case uh, which our law firm had actually filed against Russia for the return of Hasidic uh, memorabilia right. and material, where Russia is simply defying the yeah. judgment and the State Department is uncomfortable that it's uh, becoming a diplomatic uh, right. inconvenience. Did, did your case ever uh, seem to become a diplomatic uh, issue? Oh, well, very much. 
I mean, I, as I said, the State Department opposed us. They filed briefs against us and argued in the Supreme Court against us. It's, it's one of those things you learn to your dismay that your own government is not on your side. Uh, if you want, when you're dealing in foreign affairs and you want the government on your side, go to the Commerce Department. <laughs> Their job is to make things smooth for you overseas. But the State Department's job is to make all the countries happy because if we want to fly our planes over or refuel in their country, they have to be in good terms with us. That's what they think their job is, is making everybody happy, making all the governments of other countries happy with us. And so when you sue a foreign country, they are against you. And that, that was news to me, but that's what I found out. And I'm sure it's the case in the, uh, in the, the uh, Chabad uh, library case. Um, Oftentimes you have, you know, and they're finding out, uh, it's one thing to win or get a judgment, it's another thing to collect and, and actually recover something. And sometimes you get these Pyrrhic victories or these empty victories where, where you get a judgment and you can't do anything with it. And that's what's happening to lawsuits against uh, Russia. The same thing if you sue Iran or you sue, uh, you know, all, all these sort of uh, different countries. Cuba, I think it's going to be interesting to see if Cuba thaws a bit uh, what, what happens because, of course, they confiscated all the artworks uh, from families in Cuba, and so there will be a lot of families, not just artworks, wanting other property. It's going to be a real political hot potato. We'll see what, how Marco Rubio squirms around it, but it's, <laughs> it's going to be... Well, because on the one hand, there are going to be everybody who wants Cuba to open up and to go there and build new business relationships, and then there'll be all the families wanting to revive all the old relationships, and they're going to conflict like this. So we'll see how that, how that works out. I would not bet on the old families, just knowing how these things work. But you never know. Thank you very much. When you started this process, you were working for a law firm with about five names, right? Yeah, okay. right. OK, and when this was settled, did you ever hear from them? Uh, so, uh, so, so Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. Uh, actually, they closed their office in 2005, their LA office. They're still a big New York firm, but they dissolved the LA office. And the same day they announced their closure was the day uh, I also got for Maria and her family a big award from the Swiss Bank Claims Tribunal because the sugar company shares had been deposited with a Swiss bank, and the, and the Swiss bank had given up the shares. Uh, and it was the same day we got that award that they closed, and I realized, yes, I did make the right choice. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I didn't, I don't think I've heard from ones in New York. The ones in LA are still my friends. As a matter of fact, my, my boss at the time, Steve Alexander, who's portrayed in the, in the film as sort of you know, tough and stern, was not at all like that. His, uh, it turned out his, his wife's father was a Viennese Jewish emigre, and so he was extremely sympathetic, but, but also you know, didn't really see how, how it could go forward in the, in the firm. I mean, he, it just wasn't their, their business model. And, uh, but he was very, very sympathetic, and I, I have remained friends with him. He came to one of, the, one of the screenings and was very happy with the film, even though he was being portrayed by Charles Dance or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one more question? Yeah, um, I'm wondering, the, the movie dealt with the arbitrators to some extent. I'm wondering if you could tell us what you actually did to, to select the arbitrators to try to make sure that they weren't totally biased in favor of the so that was Austrian one, government. One, one of the most difficult things was picking an arbitrator because they came to us and they said, you can't tell anybody while we're negotiating this arbitration agreement. Right out of the mediation they'd said, we'll do arbitration. but it took weeks for them to draft the agreement and finalize it, and they insisted that in the agreement we name the arbitrators. And I couldn't ask anybody, I couldn't ask any of my friends for, in Vienna for advice, because Vienna is like a little fishbowl, right? If you ask one person by, by lunch, everybody in Vienna knows it. So I had to keep it all to myself, and so I picked, uh, I picked a lawyer I had met through this, this case, I had also gotten involved in some other restitution activities, and there was a, a meeting uh, convened by the State Department dealing with other claims. And I'd met this lawyer in Vienna named Andreas Nerdl, who was about my age, blonde hair, very Austrian, but it, it turned out that he had, he had one Jewish grandparent, as did his wife, 
Uh, his wife's grandfather was killed. And so he was very sympathetic, but very Austrian, Catholic. I mean, pass as 100% uh, Catholic Austrian. And, uh, and I thought that's the type of person that I want because I don't want someone, like I could have picked a Jewish lawyer in Vienna, but they would have been seen as too biased and, and just sort of an advocate for me. I wanted someone who would be one of them, right? And so I picked this lawyer, Andreas Nerdl, as the arbitrator. The Austrians initially picked a professor with a sort of unusual name, Bidlinski. I said, Bidlinski? I've heard that name, I think. And I realized his daughter-in-law was on, the, was a, she was, um, uh, a, a substitute on the art ad advisory board that decided whether to give back the paintings. And I said, you can't have an arbitrator who has Christmas dinner with someone who's on the board that he's judging, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. So, so they picked another uh, professor named Rechberger, Walter Rechberger, and then the two of them picked the third arbitrator, uh, Professor Rummel. And Professor Rummel, when they told me his name, it was right when the when the Pope was selected, whatever the, not the most recent one, but the prior one. And um, it's already so a long time ago. And, and this Andreas Nerdl called me and he said, Habemus Papam. And I said, I, said I, I hope he doesn't have the same background as that Pope. I don't know if you remember <laughs> uh, the Ratzinger's background was they had been the Hitler youth, but it was sort of a bad joke. Um, so no, they picked this guy, Rummel. Uh, and I was very happy because we had an expert opinion from uh, Professor Velzer, who is the chairman of the Institute for Civil Law at the uh, University of Vienna, who had written a, an expert opinion on the issue of the will, and that was his specialty, was inheritance law. And Velzer has a book that he publishes as part of a series that's edited by Rummel, and it's called Velzer in Rummel. So I thought, Rummel, that's great. We've got Velzer. It's going to be terrific. And then I found out, of course, they're arch enemies, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's Austria, and every, if you pick three people, they're all, everybody hates everybody else. And Welser had stopped Rummel from getting a job in Vienna, and as a result, he had to go in exile to Graz, and anyway. So I was worried. But anyway, the three of them were the arbitrators, the one we picked, the one they picked, and then this Rummel in the middle. And uh, we're very fortunate they ruled, ruled our way. It didn't have to happen. The, the other painting, I told you that they didn't give back, give back. It was the same three arbitrators. And after we won, I came back for the second arbitration. I thought, this is the easiest case. This, this portrait of Amalia Tsurkokandl, it was listed first in that inventory in 1939 in Ferdinand's home when Ferdinand is out of the country. So we don't know what happened to it next. Who cares, right? It, couldn't be anything that Ferdinand had to do with. Uh, but the, the daughter of the woman in the painting said that the Ferdinand managed to arrange for it to be given to them. And so they concocted this idea of a, a gift to that family. So that family then, then claimed it. And I think the arbitrators said, two Jewish families fighting over it. We're not going to give it to anybody. Uh, and also they had been criticized for the first decision, so we didn't get it back. But it, it, shows you, I mean, it shows you how precarious the whole thing was, that these three arbitrators, they really just defied the law completely in the second arbitration. Uh, but uh, fortunately, they came out the right way, the first one. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your excellent questions. And thank you so much, Randy, for, You're very welcome. for thank you, Terry. sharing this, this with us. It's a lot of fun. We really loved it. Thank you.